Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session on uh, Curtains Up Kashmir. We've got uh, um, Mirza Rahid here, Sonia Falero, who will be moderating this session, and Victoria Schofield. Unfortunately, uh, Bashrat Peer could not make it here today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Sonia Falero. As everyone knows um, by now, on August 5th, the Indian government unilaterally revoked the autonomy that Kashmir has held for years. It moved in tens of thousands of more troops into what was already the world's most militarized zone. It imposed a communications blockade, shutting down mobiles, internet, and landlines. Kashmiris couldn't call each other, they couldn't call us, we couldn't call them. There was no way to know what was happening, and therefore all of us uh, in India and abroad had to rely on what the government was saying. Thousands of people were jailed. So many, in fact, that some were flown to jail outside Kashmir. Politicians from opposition parties are still under house arrest. In recent days, the government has eased some restrictions, such as returning some mobile service to Kashmir. But the siege continues. Last week, a group of peaceful protesters were arrested, and they were released only after signing bonds, agreeing not to comment on, quote unquote, recent events. Gatherings of four or more people are still prohibited. Numerous people have lost their lives. To talk more about this, I'm joined by Victoria Schofield and Mirza Wahid. Victoria is a historian and the author of several books, including Kashmir in Conflict, India, Pakistan, and the Unending War, and Afghan Frontier at the Crossroads of Conflict. Wahid is a novelist and the author of three books set in Kashmir, most recently, Tell Her Everything, which has been shortlisted for the DSC Prize in South Asian Literature. Thank you. Um, Wahid, let's start with you. The collaborator is 10 years old. Yes. So would you read an excerpt for us? I will. Thank you, Sonia, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, as Sonia said, there's been this uh, siege, unprecedented siege in Kashmir. I grew up in Kashmir, and I uh, saw, witnessed, lived through uh, similar sieges when I was a young boy, a teenager. Uh, this novel came out of uh, many of those experiences. It's not autobiographical. Um, but I've come back to this novel after 10 years because what is happening in Kashmir right now is exactly what used to happen in the early 90s when the war began. We would have long sieges and long curfews that would last weeks and months. I lived through one such siege for 70 days when I was a teenager. Um, this novel came from um, my experiences as a teenager in Kashmir. Um, when you grew up in Kashmir at a time of uh, great war, when the rebellion started, uh, it was a bloodbath every day. Uh, anything you can find in a catalog of dirty war, you could find in the 90s of Kashmir. Uh, in my teenage years, I once witnessed a, a similar siege where um, a gun battle had happened the night before, and I've said this many times, and the next day, as it used to happen in those days, you're rounded off. You're asked to gather in an open space, all men and boys. Uh, they would spare the women in the city. Um, and we would be asked to gather in an open space where you sat all day, or two days, or three days. Um, during which you would be asked to parade in front of a army vehicle in which uh, would be seated a masked informer. And you were asked to walk in front of these vehicles. And the informer inside the vehicle would nod to the officer standing by, whether this person who's just walked, and you're made to look straight at the uh, vehicle, at the person inside. If the person inside, the informer, nods to the officer, you'd be taken away. Um, sometimes uh, you would never come back. And sometimes when you did come back, you would be damaged for life. I witnessed one such operation, like everyone else did. I you witnessed many such things. They had become banal by the time we, uh, in the first two, three years. During one such operation, we were led to this ground in a hospital ground by uh, my parents' house in Srinagar, which is by the Dal Lake. Um, as we walked in, I saw a few dead bodies um, lying around just like that. 
Um, but because you're asked to, you're, you know, you're uh, supposed to walk straight ahead, you can't even react, you can't even ask what that is. I was a young man, and I remember seeing these people on the ground just a few feet away. Um, by the afternoon, um, we safely assumed these were dead people. I imagined or I saw that one of them was still alive, and he, his lips moved, or probably he asked for water. Uh, one of those things. This thing, anyway, this, to, to cut a long story short, this thing stayed in my head for years and years and years. And when I, you know, I had delusions of becoming a writer, writing a novel, um, uh, this image, uh, this real image from my teenage, became the premise for the novel. But I moved the entire premise to the mountains of Kashmir, to the LOC that divides uh, two parts of Kashmir, uh, where a lot of the fighting took place. Uh, the fighting took place in the city, but a lot of it took place on the border, on this absurd border called the line of control, which literally splits Kashmir, you know, v v villages are split and rivers are split. In those days, a lot of militants who would go from Kashmir, from the cities, from Srinagar, from other towns, from villages, to Pakistan to train as militants to come back and fight with the Indian army, they would inevitably be killed on the border. You know? And many of them never saw burials because they were just dumped uh, you know, like a waste in these hidden gorges uh, and valleys. And that's where I sort of, you know, place the novel, that what happens in uh, a place like that, in the militarized wilderness, so to speak. Um, in the novel, there is a young boy who is tasked with uh, going down to such a valley to look at these dead bodies and to find anything he can find on these bodies by way of identification because uh, uh, he's employed by a ruthless army officer who needs this information to, uh, that might not work. When I read, uh, so he has this horrific task of going down. He's, he's 17, 18, 19, and that's what the book is about, his, his, his backstory. He's grown up with his band of friends who played cricket and sung songs in this beautiful, beautiful idyllic valley. And now all of his friends have gone to Pakistan, and each day he dreads that he might see one of them or all of them in this Valley of the Dead. Um, that is mostly what the novel is about, and his, his family story. He has a mother and father. His is the only family left in that militarized wilderness. I'm going to read a passage towards the uh, later part of the novel, where a lot of the things have happened that are happening for real now, which is a siege. Uh, no one is... Uh, Apart from his family, everyone else has left. There have been curfews for months and months. Um, and in that setting, in that theater, uh, one day there arrive a group of women uh, in this village from other towns. And I'm going to read, this is just four pages, and then we can talk. Is that okay? Uh, this chapter is called The Milk Beggars. It's completely fictional. It's a depiction of what could happen in a siege such as this. We have seen sieges across the world as well, in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, and in Grozny, in Gaza. Uh, one early summer day, the scarlet rose bush in front of the house had sprouted hundreds of bold, fresh buds that looked like small red crown birds. A group of withered-looking women came to the village and gathered in front of Noor Khan's shop. Can I stop briefly? I need my glasses. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this is better. One early summer day, the scarlet rose bush in front of the house had sprouted hundreds of bold, fresh buds that looked like small red crowned birds. A group of withered-looking women came to the village and gathered in front of Noor Khan's shop in a semicircle. Half of them were crying, and the ones who weren't were consoling the others. They wouldn't say anything, who they were, why they were crying, what they wanted. The words, we have children, made themselves heard more than a couple of times through the din of their wet sobbing. As soon as I heard this, I rushed home to fetch Baba. On our way back, I made Baba sprint downhill with me. Panting, I went inside the shop and let Baba deal with the situation, with this group of women who were still wailing in front of Noor Khan's bewildered face. 
With an urgent wave of the hand, Baba signaled something to Noor, who immediately brought out a jug of water from behind the shop, that old, much-dented, unsteady tin jug of his with a million black scratches on it. Baba poured a couple of glasses of water and offered it to the women in the front. He drank himself, too. I looked at the women. They didn't seem the kind to be wandering about like this without any male company. Most of them were pale, drained. They all wore patterns made of sm some light fabric, no burkas, <coughs> just colorful scars tied across their heads. From their faces, they all seemed unusually frail, almost anemic. Yes, it was the faces, wan, dried of all color, as if someone had squeezed out all the blood from them. Baba waited for them to finish drinking and then asked if they wanted to sit. The women didn't speak, but nodded to suggest they were fine the way they were. I looked at one of the leaders and saw her eyes. They were hollow, sunken, and dry, scared eyes. Noor Khan brought out more water in the jug, this time with some ancient orange squash from the shop, and in his fumbling manner also unwrapped a packet of tiger glucose biscuits from one of his dusty shelves and offered them to the women. The woman with the sunken eyes picked a couple and started eating. Her wrist, visible briefly from beneath her sleeve, was blue with bulging, sinuous veins. There were 10 or 12 of them, all the same color, a jaundiced pale. They must have been between the ages of 20 and 35. They were certainly not from the neighborhood. Their clothes had the distant stamp of a relatively <coughs> prosperous life. Baba put his hands on one of the younger girl's shoulders and said, I am the Sarpanch headman of this village. Do not worry. Whatever it is that is troubling you, you can tell me. I promise I will do everything to help. Tell me, what happened? You're like a daughter, really. Tell me, where have you come from? What's the matter? Why are you like this? I thought Baba was being tactless, too direct. But then I saw he had grasped the situation quickly and realized it needed immediate action. Assalamu alaikum, the first woman whispered. She was small, dressed in a green printed pattern embroidered with large purple flowers. Her eyes were large. She was pretty. Assalamu alaikum, everyone repeated after her. Their lips parted like dry parchment and then closed in despair. Walekum, said Baba. Walekum, repeated Noor Khan. I just nodded, undecided whether to smile or not. Uh, we have come far, far away. Uh, we have been in curfew for more than three months now. The army is everywhere and all around. There is nothing to eat, the first woman continued. The second woman stopped sobbing. No, no, uh, we don't need anything for ourselves. We can manage. It is our, and then broke down again. She was perhaps the youngest of the lot, girlish, with a long neck, neatly crafted features, frayed hair, small, ruined red cheeks, and an otherwise pallid face. The mournful chorus now said in unison, do not turn us away, empty-handed brother. Do not turn us away. We have traveled far. In spite of his best efforts, Baba looked on in bewilderment. The third woman, it is for our children that we have come this far. She had beaded tears in her eyes. A few strands of her hair flew about and shone in the sunlight. She was the loudest of the group. We just want milk. We just want milk, brother. Please give us some milk. The fourth woman, yellow jaundiced eyes, dry, powdery white face, headscarf hanging loose at the back of her head. She must have looked beautiful at some point, perhaps not too long ago. But where have you come from? Noor managed a half sure question, thousands of frown lines wrinkling his forehead. The first woman rubbed her, the shoulders of her sobbing companion and entreated Baba. I will tell you, we have babies, they're without milk, that's all we want. There is nothing left inside us to feed our children, 
That is why we have come here. The sobbing woman spoke through her tears. Threads of saliva stretched like bridges between her upper and lower lip. It has taken us all day to get here. We have walked through homes and orchards, climbed fences and concrete walls, and crossed rivers and streams to get here. Please give us some milk. We beg you. We beg you, said the first woman. I remember the day like an affecting Balraj Sani black and white film. The women stood wailing and sighing and talking to Baba one by one and all together, sometimes indistinguishable from each other. They spoke like ghosts in strange voices, cracked and bearing terrible grief. I remember looking at them, their faces and their eyes and their voices and being reminded of women who, standing in groups like theirs now, sing wedding songs, songs of harvest or songs welcoming the Eid. They stood, hands on each other's shoulders and formed a semicircle in front of Noor Khan's shop. It was exactly like women, what women do at weddings, when they get up to join each other shoulder to shoulder and then sway gently backwards and forwards, singing songs of joy and celebration, one half of the standing column picking up the ballad from the other half's lines, Vanavun and Ruf, two singing styles. This was exactly like that, only these women had tears rolling down their cheeks, streaming down their withered necks and all the way to the collars and front pieces of their long pedants, which now had darkened with moisture. I stayed rooted to where I sat, trying hard not to break into tears. Noor Khan still had the jug of water in his hand. Baba scratched at his beard, and the women continued to lean forward each time they had to speak. We want some milk, the fourth woman said. Our babies will die. Zubaydah's daughter died last night. Did you hear? Did you hear that? The third woman again, the one with the henna hair. Our breasts are barren now. Nothing left for our children, nothing. We have eaten all the grass in our gardens and finished all the pulses we have and cooked every grain of rice there ever was. Now we have eaten our gherat too, our honor. There is nothing left in my bosom, the oldest woman, oldest looking woman, who had mostly kept silent till now, let out a wheezing, cracking moan and lifted her pedon up to reveal two shriveled, wrinkled, darkened breasts over a sunken, hollow looking stomach. Dark bite marks that looked like scabs surrounded the nipples. Baba looked away. Noor Khan and I stood still. There was a fat, gleaming candle drop on her left breast. Pus. My baby will die. My baby will die. The woman at the back shrieked and broke down. If you give me milk, if you give me milk, I'll give you one of my girls. All we need is milk. Milk is everything. The first woman hummed, the small, pretty one. The mournful chorus now swayed in unison again. Do not turn us away empty-headed. Do not turn us away. We have traveled far. It will end someday. It will. One day there will be no curfew. And then there will be milk. One day the curfew king will die. And there will be milk. Thank you. Yeah. That was very moving. Thank you so much. Um, you've lived here for many years, but you have family in Kashmir. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got in touch with them, how you heard news of them, and the impact that this siege has had on you personally and on your family? Hmm, where does one begin? Um, in the first couple of weeks, when, when there was no word from Kashmir, we uh, heard of uh, about our loved ones, including my parents, including everyone's, uh, everyone else's uh, kin and families, in the most medieval way, which is that I, uh, that somebody had seen my father in the neighborhood. This someone then uh, met another person who traveled to Delhi the next day. Mm -hmm. In Delhi, this person met a friend of mine and said, if you are in touch with Wahid, tell him I've seen your father. 
which so it was one of those uh, uh, classic cases of I, I, I began to think of it as you know when you have endangered species then they're spotted you know and then you report that they've been spotted you know it was one of those things but then I wasn't the only person in that sort of uh, situation it was millions of people you know Kashmiri diaspora is quite strong here in America and Europe so all of us were doing these uh, you know finding ways of you know uh, how do you find out what happens to your parents or your sisters and um, the impact on someone like me or Kashmiri students in India or abroad, it's the same as any, any, any child that you worry endlessly. And then, uh, but then you also take uh, some kind of uh, uh, relief from the fact that you're not the only one. You know? mm. uh, and the fact that, uh, yes, this siege has been unprecedented and uh, that it's always happened. It's, not, it's nothing new. Uh, sometimes people's memories are short. In the early 90s, it was exactly like that, mm. and worse probably in many cases because there was a lot of bloodshed. There was a lot of there was massacres every day, every week. Uh, they lived through that. So Kashmiris, in many ways, like people from let's say Gaza or, or other such places, are are trained uh, to to deal with it. Uh, I like to think that we are we are accomplished hoarders uh, because of our. Uh, of where we are, uh, you know, geographically, uh, you know, surrounded in the mountains. So over the centuries, you become trained hoarders with regard to food. You have lots of food in your houses, but also because of our political history. There's uh, repression is not recent. You know, mm. uh, the current repression in many ways goes back to <coughs> 1989. It's been 30 years of a siege in many ways. Uh, but even before then, it's never been a uh, you know, politically stable place. We've always had conflict because yes. of the unresolved uh, central dispute of Kashmiri self-determination. Uh, so Kashmiris are sort of accomplished holders. So we, we do this, and there's also always food. So for instance, I knew that my family would have medicines for at least three months. You know. I like to joke about it sometimes that most Kashmiri families, if you go to their drawing room or living room, they will have small mini pharmacies. In, in, their, in, their, in their cabinets because they store lots of medicines because you know that you need these medicines and you would sort of have lots of lots of medicines in your houses. So you deal with it because you're trained to deal with it, but that doesn't lessen the impact because, especially for someone like me or many others uh, who, who, know, who, who write and think about Kashmir, mm. uh, and you are supposed to be objective and, you know, and, and dispassionate. But then you're also writing about the destruction of your home in many ways. So it's a curious, it's a difficult place to be in because if you are on TV, you are going to the BBC or you know, Radio 4, and you have to tell them what it is like. And yet, you're always aware that you're talking about your people, about your house, about mm -hmm. your home, about your nieces and nephews. They're there. Yeah. Yeah. Victoria, you've been going to Kashmir since the 90s, is that correct? Well, actually, my first visit was in 1981. 1981, yes. okay. Um, it seems to me that there are two issues here. One is the political dispute, and one is the issue of how people in Kashmir feel about who they are, where they belong, what, where, what they love. Um, I want Wahid to talk about, you know, the the people, um, but I, I wonder if you could just walk us through some of the decisions that the Indian government has made over the recent years, even before Modi. We, I think all of us understand what happened is an outcome of, of Modi's ideology. Um, that is fairly well understood, though, though please do, do go into that if you'd like. But even prior to Modi, what are some of the things that were done that have led us to this point and that have created this situation? Well, I'd also say some of the things that have not been done. Yeah, and I think sure. that's one of the things. Firstly, I'd like to say I'm delighted to be here at the British Library at the LLF. And for those of you who came to listen to Basharat Pia, I'm sorry I'm not Basharat, um, but I do have a great affection for Kashmir and for Kashmiris. As Mirza Wahid knows, we've sat on many panels together. And um, I've, since I did first go to the Valley of Kashmir in 1981, I've had a vision of this beautiful place yet fraught by tragedy. And I think, again, for an issue, a, a dispute, a conflict, whatever you like to call it, it's very difficult to parachute in at a particular moment in history. 
many people start talking about Kashmir in relation to the insurgency and in the 1990s. And that's when I, I also did some reporting for BBC during the insurgency. But uh, you've got to go back and really unpeel other layers and talk about the, the history, the, the partition, and um, even 1846, the creation of, of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which, which we British and the British Empire days put together as a construct of a territory in order to have a buffer against the rising power of the Sikhs. All of this, I think, has to be put into the mix when understanding where we are now mm. and what's been done and what's not been done. But fast forwarding, of course, to 1947, what was not done was decided which new dominion this former princely state should go to. And this is what future generations are really reaping uh, the benefit or lack of benefit of the fact of not having, having taken a decision at partition. And uh, there's, it, there's many ways to blame this person, blame that person, but the fact of the matter is we wouldn't have what we call the Jammu Kashmir issue now if a decision had been taken in 1947. Mm -hmm. And somehow in the last 70 plus years, we've been limping along with mini decisions, mini actions, another major action, and then a mini action, which has never got us to resolution. And this is where and I feel when you hear um, the collaborator or you know, even Bashar's books uh, in fiction, this is what can be happening in fact. And it's so important with this issue to think we're talking about people who live there. It's not a territorial dispute between India and Pakistan. It is an issue which affects the lives of millions of people. And I think that's a very important fact. But notwithstanding that, until this dispute is resolved between India and Pakistan with a representation of the people, you're going to continue to have the human rights abuses, which broadly speaking are situations of curfew, lockdown, shutdown, shut off communications, what we've just seen now. But again, as uh, he says, it's been going on indefinitely. And your analogy of your mini pharmacists, when um, I was visiting Kashmir with my husband in, in May this year, we went to dinner with some friends and one of the things that she took delight in showing me around was her vegetable garden. And I'm very interested in gardening, but it, this had a special significance because she told me how many different vegetables they grew because, she said, we can then survive a lockdown. We can survive a curfew. And I mean, as I say, it's, it, these are the things you don't think about mm. when you're just talking about the issue in, in sort of the cold light of day. But when you think how it affects the lives of people, but for all those people who don't have pharmacies or have pharmacies and have vegetable patches, there are people who don't have pharmacies and don't have vegetable patches. And I think this is what we've seen in the last two months um, has been a situation where people haven't been able to get medical help, haven't been able to <coughs> go to the hospital when they've needed to. And this of itself is a denial of a basic human right that you haven't got freedom to move um, because of curfew, because of lockdown. But, you know, I hope that's partially answered your question. We've got here now because the leaderships of these countries have never managed to sit down and resolve the issue. There's always been something else going on or some hubris somewhere that has made them fail to do so. And I think I feel quite strongly about it myself as a writer and a historian because I'm getting into the historian side. Instead of being a journalist on Kashmir, I'm now a historian because I'm interviewing and meeting a whole new generation of Kashmiris who weren't born when I started writing uh, my first book. And so I feel this lack of decision-making has now been foisted on, on this next generation. And this was particularly tragic. I saw this at the university I went to, the University of Kashmir, and also at a school in Srinagar, where these are young people, again, you know, I'm sure we're all parents. We've all had teenagers. We've all had children growing up with their aspirations. And when you have young students, you see them lining up to take their exams, and then suddenly you hear this curfew, the schools are shut. One of our friends was a maths teacher at the University of Pulwama, and she said, you have no idea how difficult it is to get the students to go through the maths curriculum when, when there's a, when there's a, suddenly there's a curfew. We have to beg them to study in their holidays. Well, children don't like studying in their holidays. So it's this kind of, um, as I say, dysfunctional society, which one would say that, Kashmiris deserve, like everybody else,
to go to school, to, to be able to fulfill their lives. And when you went in May, was that uh, prior to the elections or? It was during the election during time, the elections. because as you know, the election was staggered. Um, what was very interesting by being there in May, uh, and I was going back after a, an absence of, of several years, uh, was that there was already this feeling, um, and again, this resilience that, that you're, you're, you, you were talking about in terms of, oh dear, we're gonna have to withstand something else. There was an anxiety because they felt, many people I spoke to felt that once the elections have uh, taken place, the second time round, and I'm afraid the only person who I spoke to during that visit was Arundhati Roy, who thought Modi would not win. Um, she was, I think, hopeful more than anything else. But everybody was aware that he was going to come in with a landslide. Yeah. And uh, there was this feeling, because it had been on the, in the manifesto, it's not a surprise, this abrogation of Article 370. Uh, I think people didn't really understand the small print as to what it actually meant, which is this um, ability to change the demographics um, by allowing non-Kashmiris to purchase land. Mm. Um, the actual Article 370 itself has already long since been um, eroded, but it was this, and I think a lot of people didn't understand The other it. Article 35A. But <coughs> Article 35A was very important, and I talked to a number of people, and they were saying, well, you know, it's, um, this is sort of going to change the whole character of Kashmir if, if this goes through, but they were anxious that it was going to go through. And, you know, the supreme irony was that it was by... Um, Article 35A was put in by Nehru, uh, endorsed by Jawaharlal Nehru in 1952, and he saw the, the difficulty of a beautiful area. And um, I think it was his quotation speaking in the Lok Sabha in 1952. He said, why, just because somebody's rich, should they come up and buy all the delectable places? His word was delectable. And this is the essence of it. Um, it's Kashmir for the Kashmiris, and now you've got sort of a free-for-all. You don't quite know what's going to happen. And the character of this beautiful land um, is going to change. Yeah. Mm. You have uh, a piece that you'd like to read for us. Well, I'd, I'd actually like to, to read a piece which is both beautiful and um, also sort of at, to the point where we're, we're at now. Um, in, in it describes a, a, a sort of a moment in time during this, this visit we had in May. Shortly before 4 a.m., a chorus of voices erupted across Dal Lake from the mosques of Srinagar, signaling the beginning of prayer time. For those observing Ramadan, they would already have had their only meal of the day until the sun set and they could break the fast at Iftar. It's a tradition which is immutable throughout the Muslim world, but in the Valley of Kashmir, on this glistening May morning, the chanting seemed especially beautiful. As the sun rose, and the sky began to lighten over the ring of mountains, dusted by snow. Each refrain was echoed a few minutes later by a nearby mosque. It seemed as though the whole valley was singing. I returned to Kashmir after nearly a decade. There were noticeable differences with numerous recently constructed houses and a new flyover to improve Srinagar's congested traffic. But much was unchanged. The valley's magnificence, the sprawling town encircling Dal, and Nagin lakes, the bounteous flowers and waterfalls in the Nishat and Shalimar gardens, and the quantities of stray dogs feasting on the uncollected rubbish. But above all, there remains a sense of despair that the political life of the valley's six million inhabitants will ever change. And that brings us to August 5th. Thank you. Wahid, I recently had a conversation with a Kashmiri friend, and uh, one of the things she said to me was, you know, you could put a gun to my head, and I'll never feel Indian. And I don't know how to explain this to Indians without giving them offense. It's just how I feel. And I think that for a lot of Indians who have great empathy for Kashmir and the situation, perhaps that might still not be something that they understand. Um, so my questions to you are, is this, would you say this is a sentiment that is commonly felt? And how would you explain it to people outside? It's very simple. Kashmiris have never felt Indian hmm. because they've never been Indian. And we have to go back to 47, Victoria, 47 and 48. The, the entire 
uh, existence of these articles that linked Kashmir to the larger Indian Union was not done out of love by Kashmiris for right. India. It was a compulsion. Yeah. The articles come into being because Kashmiris at the time are told very categorically on record by Nehru and by the Indian Parliament and by Patel and by many other people at the UN that we will solve Kashmir. Until then, please remain with us. And who agrees to this? The then popular leader, Sheikh Abdullah, you know, mm. is persuaded by Nehru, who was his great friend. Of course, Nehru puts him in prison for years soon after. Uh, uh, that you know, we will protect your unique status and identity and culture. And we will enshrine this in the constitution by way of these articles. That's a guarantee. And that's why Sheikh Abdullah, who had led a very popular movement called the Plebiscite Front on Urdu, Mahaze Rai Shumari, you know, which was a very popular mass movement. Everyone supported Sheikh Abdullah in that. What does it mean? That means Kashmiris will be given the right to choose via a plebiscite. That's mm. why the name Plebiscite Front. Nehru knew this. Indian state knew this, that Sheikh is very, very popular. And sh even after these articles come into being, they know he would make, Sheikh Abdullah would talk about plebiscite now and then. And that's why the Indian state then gets worried and puts him in prison. Mm. Until the time he's broken. When he comes out in prison, 1974? 72. 72. He comes out of prison, he's a broken man. So he agrees then, because he's now completely, he's been finished. You know, by Nehru, by his great friend. And he agrees because before then, Kashmir had a prime minister, you know, and until August 4, we had our own constitution, our own flag, because the main conditions of the so-called accession were that India would look after foreign affairs, telecom and defense. Everything else will stay with the Jammu and Kashmir, with the Kashmiri state. Yeah. But Kashmiri's, the battle, Kashmiri's battle was not never about these articles. It was about the right to choose, about their right to self-determination, as promised on the floor of Indian Parliament by India's first Prime Minister, and as it's enshrined in the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, in the UN Charter. And why did Nehru deny Kashmir a plebiscite? Well, it, it is complicated, and one does have to go back to the history. Unfortunately, what, what you had and, and, uh, is a situation where both um, leaders of Pakistan and India at the time, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, agreed to have a plebiscite. Um, and the UN was brought in in order to sort out the conditions under which the plebiscite should, should be held. Mm. But the truth of the matter is both leaders agreed because they wanted to win it. And you can't have a method of adjudication that you're not prepared to lose. Mm. And once one side saw that it was going to lose, there was a prevarication. And then the other side saw it was going to lose, so there was more prevarication. And he is absolutely right. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru promised it, but then he also thought that he had the support of Sheikh Abdullah and those who supported Sheikh Abdullah. When he realized that Sheikh Abdullah was not as quite as popular as um, he thought he was, he then rather prevaricated over holding the plebiscite. And there's a letter I found when I was researching my first book, um, where he's writing to Sardar Patel, uh, uh, really sort of saying that the problem is that now we haven't, we're not, we can't really quite sure, and if we don't don't do something, you know, plebiscite's going to be round the corner. Mm -hmm. But the critical point, and this is, uh, you know, again part of the history, is that in order for the plebiscite to be held, the UN suggested a, a troop withdrawal. There was to be a phased troop withdrawal because both the Indian Army and elements of the Pakistan Army had moved into. Uh, the state into Jammu and Kashmir, and they'd stopped more or less along what uh, we now have as the line of control. It was the ceasefire line. And so there had to be a phase withdrawal out, because otherwise there was no point holding a plebiscite if people had the army sitting, uh, intimidating them. Mm. And, of course, from Pakistan's point of view, the last thing they wanted to do was to withdraw from the area which they, were, which they had managed to gain control of, which is Gilgit Baltistan, as we now call it, and um, that narrow strip of land which um, is called Azad Jammu and Kashmir, free Jammu and Kashmir in Pakistan, but the Indians persist in still calling Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And there was no trust. They didn't feel that if they withdrew their troops, um, they were worried that the Indians would then move back again and take uh, what they'd, they'd managed to, to gain control of. And so that gave ample opportunity for Nehru to say, uh, well, we can't hold the plebiscite because they haven't withdrawn their troops. 
and they weren't prepared to withdraw their troops until Pakistan had withdrawn the troops. And that's essentially why the plebiscite was never held. Um, and I don't think Nehru got greedy. He didn't, he didn't want to. Leave. No, exactly. They didn't really want to hold it. They looked for he, reasons he, he looked not for reasons, to hold excuses, it. He looked for reasons, excuses, but he did, he did get greedy. And, and then he decided that because he, he had this, he, yeah. he had a, the Kashmir held up at a certain place. Yeah. Yeah. Of and course, for him. You know? And once they've uh, got the values, I think the important thing is to realize also, and this is where it's, it's very difficult, um, especially for those people who are fighting for the independence of the whole state. There is an attachment to the whole state mm. um, being going one way or the other. And this was certainly what was anticipated. When I went to Delhi in the 1990s and I was doing interviews, I interviewed the Maharaja's son, Karan Singh. Mm. And he actually said to me, what my father should have done was preside over the peaceful partition of the state. Because there were some areas which obviously should have gone to India and some areas which obviously should have gone to Pakistan, like Gilgit Baltistan. Um, but he went on to say, but we were dealing with a once in a millennium phenomenon and my father just wasn't really up to it. Um, but thi this is the problem we face now when Owen Dixon, one of the UN um, uh, um, representatives who went to try and sort out the conditions for holding the plebiscite in 1950, he went there and he saw the difficulties and um, his reports online and actually it makes very good reading even today because it's not a new phenomenon. Many people understood what the problems of Jammu and Kashmir mm. were as far back as 1950. And he talked more about in terms of zonal plebiscite, because having this unitary plebiscite in a land that was so different in complexion, already the Ladakhis were beginning to get concerned. And they were actually petitioning to go to Tibet before the Chinese came and invaded Tibet. Mm. Um, so, but again, I say this goes contrary to the argument which is felt by those who want the um, independence of the whole state, um, that, you know, the thought of breaking it up. But that's why we're at such a big impasse, because um, the idea now for the whole state to go either to India or either to Pakistan uh, makes no sense when you've got a movement for independence. Yeah. And now very, very strong uh, movement for independence. Yeah. It has only grown. Absolutely. Well, it's grown particularly no, in the yeah. 1990s. No one in Kashmir wants to be with India. No one, now, especially after this. You know, if there were people, no one. If, 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 if there was, you know, there were segments in, 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 in Kashmir which were called unionist politicians and the so-called mainstream. Uh, of course, there's another debate about what is mainstream and what is not. Uh, even those people who swore by India, who did India's job in Kashmir, who were India's uh, errand Like boards. Farooq Abdullah. Yeah, like Farooq Abdullah. <laughs> no, I, I, I absolutely, I can name all of them, but we don't have the time. <laughs> uh, the the uh, who, who I call you know kind of suave collaborators of the Indian state, uh, they have been put in prison. They were not let out their houses. So I was going to come back to the siege. You know the yeah. the, the new siege is. Yeah. I've been thinking about it because you know that's what you do. It is the most punitive siege in of, in, in my in my sort of you know experience and what we've read uh, of course history. They have tortured little kids. They have tortured people in mosques and broadcast their screams at night to terrify entire populations. And each day when people like me, when you think I'm terrified uh, about what might happen in Kashmir next, reading and hearing and listening to people in the state who, when word gets out, they have surrounded entire localities. They burned down houses. So you have to imagine what is happening now is all that has been inflicted on Kashmir in the last 30 years and more. You know, why do I say that? So I've been thinking about this. Is, this is a, two kinds of siege mm. uh, in, in play in Kashmir right now. A medieval siege, which is, which is dressed in the language of conquest. Uh, I'm sure many of you must have heard when, when the article was abrogated, there was widespread celebration uh, in large sections of Indian society, which is the most worrying thing about all this. There's social sanction. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, this punitive action in Kashmir. They're, they're, they're happy. And the songs emerged in, in the vernacular media, which uh, were about people singing and dancing to lines that said, now we are free to get Kashmiri girls. And that didn't happen on the fringe, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's not yeah. some small little thing on the fringes. These are songs in the vernacular media. There were BJP ministers talking about joking. That's the word. 
They made jokes about, oh, now you can marry Kashmiri women. Okay. So you have to think about this is an existential threat for us. When you talk about demographics in Article 35A and everything, Kashmiris are now, you see, uh, many of you might have read, there is a quiet civil disobedience uh, movement that is shaking, taking shape as we speak. What do I mean by that? They have refused, Kashmiris have refused to open their shops, open their businesses. They're not sending kids to schools, you know, when there have been relaxations and restrictions. Because they have said that we don't want you to paint this as normalcy. Because that's what the Indian state did. It sort of appointed certain status sort of sections of the media, which is not sections anymore, which are large sections of the media, uh, you know, which do the state's bidding, especially when it comes to situations like Kashmir. So they were, so if you have a traffic jam because of check posts, they would film these traffic jams and then broadcast them as images of Kashmir returning to normal. The jam is there because they're not allowing movement. You know. And they did this via, uh, Friendly journalists, yeah. status hacks is another description one could use. Uh, or propagandists, to speak plainly. So we are dealing with that kind of scenario. It's a, it's a siege in many forms. The, the, the biggest, one of the biggest wounds that the Kashmiris feel right now is that there are people celebrating when our house is set on fire. There is media who are each night, each night, you know, forcing a narrative on Kashmir. And Kashmir is saying, no, 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 no. That's not what's happening here. Yes. You know? When you have that sort of theater, when you have that kind of context, you have to go back with that, why is there celebration? Why is there widespread support? Because now, you know, coming back to your original question about Modi, this is what they've done over the, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't turn a population into something overnight. They've been broadcasting these things for years now, you know, by which you prepare a population for this kind of brutal move which is n uh, nine year old boys have been tortured. Nine, my son is 10 um, because they want to set an example. You know, people have been taken away in the middle of the night from their beds, um, literally boys snatched from their beds. And you know, there are kids, we don't know where they are because as you said in, the, in your introduction, rightly so. So they get these people or teenagers, young men, they send them to jails, like the British used to do, hello, uh, to places where we don't know. Some b parents are saying, okay, is my son in Agra? Is my son in Tihar? Is my boy in some other jail, in some prison? There are many families in Kashmir, as we speak, who do not know where their kids are. They've been arrested and then moved in trucks or planes and flown out of the state. Well, now, there is nothing, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. there's nothing more that tells you it is in all manifestations, an occupation, a military occupation. That's what you do. You surround a population. You, you see, the siege, they, they just announced a siege. They rushed in troops, as you said. You know? But they didn't need to make a siege. Kashmir has already been in siege. When you have uh, uh, 700,000 troops surrounding a small valley and interspersed in our towns and villages and, and our rivers, it is a siege which has been there forever. They just announced this via this abrogation. Mm. That's one. And then this idea that now it's an, an annexation, you know, um, in, there is no other word. It's an annexation. It is Kashm they, they decided to annex Kashmir. But what I was going to say is Kashmiris are now, because I know what Kashmiri people are like, because we know we've read history, they will not relent. What do you think they, wh what, what, what are Kashmiris thinking right now? You would know. What are they going to do in in, in the months to come? As I said, it, it terrifies me every time, you know, when you think about what might happen, you know. What has happened so far is there have been protests which haven't, you know, sort of been reported well because they have also clamped down on Kashmiri media. So when you had journalists from Delhi and other places parachute into Srinagar on the day after the abrogation, all Kashmiri journalists, and Kashmiri, Kashmiri journalists are some of the bravest people in the world, yeah. you know, and, uh, and they know how to do this. Uh, they didn't have any resources, nothing. They had not even a phone, forget internet, forget 4G, you know. They don't even, they didn't, they, they had also cut their old fashioned landlines. Somebody at the BBC recently asked me, why did they cut off landlines? And I said, because they don't want you to dial into a Kashmiri family at night, you know, to ask them how they are. 
now they have restored landlines after five weeks or six weeks and then but why did they do that they did that they did not want the world to know they did not want Kashmiri journalists who work for places like AP and AFP and the BBC and other such places. Mm. They didn't want them to report. What does it tell you? It's very clear yeah. that we will send our people who will report exactly how we want it to be reported. You know, it didn't work, of course. That's another story because Kashmiri journalists, as I said, they, the kids have grown up. They, have no, they know how to do this. So they would collect their reports, collect their photos, collect their videos, go to an airport, find a memory stick, send it to Delhi in the old-fashioned way, mm. to their bureaus from where it was broadcast to the world. One of the first videos that emerged from Kashmir, which sort of punctured the propagandist narrative, was this of a massive protest in a locality not, fair, not far from where my parents live, where I grew up, a neighborhood called Sora. Mm. Um, I wanted to just take up the point which uh, Rahid was making in terms of the argument that this has been done for to help Kashmiris develop mm. because it's the oldest <laughs> oldest colonial <laughs> argument in the book yeah um, or indeed for the benefit of the women when there have been no um, inquiries into any of the cases mm. the, the, the rapes of women um, that it's as I say it's a, it's a very typical old colonial argument yeah. but in fact the human development indicators for Kashmir is mm. there's less poverty there's greater literacy. They live longer. Then Gujarat. And more people. Prime ministers. Uh, the state. model state. The yes. model state of Gujarat. Yes, yeah. you see. Sure. Um, and so I just. And I education. I think, yes, as I said, they're more educated. Um, and I think that's an Im important point to make. I also yeah. wanted to say that one of the things that really shocked me when I was in Kashmir, you were talking about the taking away of the young boys, was how the young school children were being told to inform on each other. And that was creating this atmosphere of not wanting three or four people together because you wouldn't know who had been asked to be an informant. Um, and that's, that's a horrible thing to put on a, a young child yeah. um, with, with some kind of bribe. What might happen, you know, when you ask what might happen, what might happen would be very, very bloody and dangerous because the young in Kashmir, they're very angry. Yeah. There is, um, as I said, there have been sieges before. Each generation, this is the third generation of Kashmiris who are witnessing this. Each generation <laughs> is filled with a sense of humiliation. Many years ago, when I started writing about these things, someone asked me, how, how do Kashmiris feel? And I said, there is a permanent sense of insult among Kashmiris, which goes back to this historic denial of their basic political rights, which is, you know, they don't want to be with you. So now, yeah. the... Even the fig leaf of procedure and, and, and you know, due process, not that, it ex not that we were better off in, under previous regimes, you know, the Congress regimes, that has been blown away. So it's naked aggression, uh, which is we will do er anything we want to do to you, and you can't do anything about it, including deciding your future by way of abrogation. We're not going to consult you. Uh, it was unconstitutional. Yeah, and uh, of course the illegality is there. You know, it was completely illegal. You know, there's no legal basis for this because you can only revoke these articles by way uh, through uh, uh, endorsement by the state legislature. That state legislature doesn't exist. There was a man sent by Delhi who gives a nod to Delhi's decision. You know, it was as uh, terrible and as colonial as as that. Uh, but it has filled a new generation with a with anger and a sense of humiliation. And how do you possibly imagine these people are going to one day say, OK, thank you very much for this, and now we're going to be uh, model Indian citizens from now on. It's, it's inconceivable yeah. for me. Um, we're, we've run out of time, but I do have one last question. Uh, the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan wrote a very powerful op-ed in the New York Times. Um, he spoke out at the UN. Um, he made a very convincing argument. But that argument hasn't gained traction. We're seeing protests all over the world, people protesting against human rights abuses in different parts of the world. We're just not seeing that sort of protest in India or anywhere else. Why doesn't it seem to matter? Well, I, I would like to point out that um, all of you should look on, on um, the internet at the congressional hearing, which took mm. place on Tuesday. Of course. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's, that's a very important milestone. I myself went to Washington for the briefing. Uh, we expected 60 people to turn up, 120 people turned up. There were very informed questions. There is concern. Mm. And the fact that for the first time ever, there's been a congressional hearing on, um, on South Asia and with particular reference to Kashmir is, is a step forward. Of course, it needs to be then built on. 
But I think from Pakistan's point of view, one of the difficulties about Pakistan saying anything is that that also feeds into the narrative of India that they are, this is all Pakistan's fault. Mm, mm, mm. And they effectively turn a blind eye to what Wahid has just described as the alienation within the Valley of Kashmir, because it's all too easy for international con to consumption to say, this is all Pakistan, Pakistan instigated it, Pakistan fuels um, all the dissent. And so in a way, the best thing that Pakistan can do is to, is to keep garnering international support mm. and have that international voice become louder. And I think it, it will come louder because I think this is, in a way, it's unprecedented as what um, someone said, you know, it's like you've had the chessboard and you've moved pieces on the chessboard for the past 70 years. Now the chessboard's been chucked out and you've got a whole new chessboard. It's a, it's a new chessboard. Up. With regard to Pakistan, what they could do better, of course, is, you see, there is, people sometimes forget, there is a part of Kashmir uh, under Pakistan. Mm. Um, the neutral term being Pakistan, Amnesty Kashmir and Indian Amnesty Kashmir. Three days ago, or four days ago, there, or the last week, there were protests in Pakistan, in Kashmir, in Muzaffarabad. Yeah? These are people who are Kashmiris. Mm. They were not charged. One. Then they go to a, the, to a press club in Muzaffarabad. Yeah? The press club is attacked by the police. Now, you shouldn't do that. How can you do that? If, you're, if you want to help your cause, so to speak, if you are cracking down on these people in your part of Kashmir, who are protesting, you know, and then you're going to be asked about that. <coughs> so that they could do something better about that. You know. Why? But yeah, I mean, there was a good speech by Mr. Khan at, at the UN. <laughs> <laughs> What can people... No, no, it was, it was. It was, it was a good speech. Yeah. We it was a good speech. Question. It, was a, it was a good we speech. We do, yeah. I, I do want to ask one very quick question. Everybody always wants to know how to help, how to express solidarity. What, what advice do, do the two of you have? Just to regular people, what can regular people do to express what they feel about the situation and, and to rally for a change? They, they should... Uh, I do... I'm, if I was a political analyst, I could possibly come up with scenarios, you know, but I'm a novelist. I prefer to remain in the category which is called a naive and sentimentalist novelist. Uh, with, uh, and in that context, I would say, you know, they should keep doing what people in America, in Europe, in these universities. There's been so, uh, unprecedented level of solidarity, including the Congressional hearing, where, which was unprecedented, which was a, uh, a landmark. Uh, in, with regard to that, uh, the Kashmiri scholar Natasha Kaur, my friend, uh, made a very, very good, powerful testimony, uh, and uh, Anna Chatterjee and, and some other people from the Amnesty. Uh, that was unprecedented, mm -hmm. as Victoria said earlier. It's never happened before. Uh, but that came about because there was a lot of uh, work done by Kashmiri students and Kashmiri academics in, in, in the U.S., uh, and there have been uh, nice uh, acts of solidarity uh, in, across Europe. Um, not much in the Middle East, uh, for some strange reason, <laughs> uh, where there's a lot of South Asians, you know, uh, I think we know why. Uh, they, people should just keep doing, it's, a friend of mine meant this guy is a Samaritan, you know, and I worry that this, um, because I've seen it before since teenage, that this, that we are going to be living in a permanent siege in some form or the other. And then to that I say, don't take your eyes off the ball, you know, because it's not going to end. It's I also think to be informed and understand the issue, because I think one of the problems is that it's sort of batted about. It's batted about between Islamabad and Delhi, um, and looking to what the end game can be, looking to what a possible resolution could be for the benefit of the people, because it's the people who suffer. And as I said before, while, there is, while it's not a resolved issue, you're going to continue to get human rights abuses. And the objective has to be to hmm. um, enable Kashmiris to lead the lives that we all lead. Yeah. But there's been some good things, as in many people now understand that Kashmir is not merely a human rights issue. Hmm. You know? It's not just about abuse. Uh, uh, one doesn't want to diminish that. You know? It is a deeply, deeply disturbing thing in our lives, in our uh, histories, you know, the, the historic abuse. Uh, did, uh, does anyone, if anyone know here that one in six Kashmiris has faced some form of torture in their life. One in six Kashmiris. 
49 percent, 49, and these are not my figures. This is a major MSF study that was done three years ago, two years ago, actually. It came out in 2016, uh, the first of its kind, detailed study of mental health in Kashmir. 49 percent, half the population of Kashmir, suffers from some form of PTSD. Half the women in Kashmir, half, 50 percent of Kashmiri women have some form of depression. You, know? you walk into any Kashmiri household from any class, you, know, you will see people on pills. I know people who have been on antidepressants for 25 years uh, without a single pill. So that's what, it, you know, that's what vitality does to you. That's what uh, an occupation does to a population. But as, as I was saying, it's not merely about human rights abuses. It's about a political future of Kashmiris. Mm. It's about what they want. You know? And the first step in solidarity is understanding it from their point of view. You know? uh, and that goes a long way. Yes. And I think the Indian authorities don't want to admit that there's trauma because the minute they admit there's trauma, then they have to concede that there's something very wrong there. Yes. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Is that right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> questions. questions. Okay, Question. if we just two questions, no, no, no comments. Nice to meet you. Okay, we can only take questions, but they have to be questions and very brief. So this lady sitting here on the third row, your brief question, please. I was born and raised in India to a Hindu family. And I know what's happening in Kashmir in, on the Indian side. And the picture Mirza has uh, created is, is very true to the reality. As, as a journalist, as well, I can say that. Now, the problem is, if I want to uh, express my solidarity with the Kashmiris, here's the problem. I'm probably one of the few Indians here in the audience. If I go out, join a march only for Kashmiris, my government will say, you're anti-national. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want my, my conviction to be hijacked by the Pakistani government saying, mm. you, you know, this is she, look, look at another Indian. She's marching against her government. Where do people like me go? Is question. there a space of yeah, protest question. for people like me? Thank you. I mean, that is ideally a question for the Indian state, <laughs> you know, or, or the Pakistani state, that how will they describe you? I know of people, and I have friends in India. I spent eight wonderful years in Delhi as a student. I went to Delhi University. It was a nicer, kinder India is how I described it back then. You know, it had, uh, the country had problems, enormous <laughs> problems even then, uh, but it was a kinder, kinder place. Uh, so I have friends in India. They, some of them have uh, become silent because of exactly what you mentioned, you know. They know exactly what's going on in Kashmir. They do not speak at all, you know, uh, because of exactly what you mentioned, because the moment they open their mouth, they are branded as anti-national. Forget anti-national, seditious, yes, seditious. unpatriotic, mm. traitors. Like Alan Duffy. So many of them then make a choice. You know, do they continue speaking, you know, or do they stay silent? You know? I can't help anyone. I can't help you with regard to a path forward. It is for you to determine. With regard to how, if you are painted or used or deployed by the other state in many ways, I don't think you should worry about that. Because you, are, you have a voice. You have your own voice. You need to... Sorry, sorry. sorry. Sorry, new, uh, sorry. Uh, there is no such thing as a neutral protest. You know? There is no such thing as a neutral protest. A protest is not neutral. Uh, by, but however, however, there are plenty of people in this country, you know, and in America and other places in the world, who have foregrounded Kashmiri voices. You know? Just because the other people join in, who some of them will join because of genuine solidarity, irrespective of whether they are Pakistanis or Indians or Turkish or uh, from Korea. But what can't happen is because I'm going to be seen with some people, I'm not going to speak up. 
that is a decision that you will have to make. Okay. Do we have another brief question, please? My, my question is about uh, the, the pundits of, of Kashmir. And I wanted to know, as a, as a historian, as someone who lived in the 80s and 90s during the insurgency, what was the impact upon the political climate of Kashmir when the exodus of the pundits took place? Mm. And also, I think that's a very important narrative to consider because it informs the communal ethos of the Indian government today, which says that revoking Article 370 is a mechanism for uh, restoring the pundits to the valley. and mm. That's something that is ignored with the Article 35A discussion, which is not, it's not simply a mechanism for demographic re-engineering, but it might, in the Indian government's view, facilitate the, 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 the return of the pundits. So I think, no, I just wanted you... That's not what the Indian state wants. The Indian state has now cleverly used the Kashmiri pundit suffering. No, I, I, no I, 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 answer, I, I understand I need to answer that. that. I need to answer that. I was there when the Kashmiri pundit exodus happened, in the, in the city. Yeah? And like everyone, I was a teenager when it happened. You know, we're completely puzzled and depressed what has happened, you know? And uh, Kashmiri pundits suffered, you know, enormous tragedy, enormous suffering, because you, anyone who loses their home, you know, is enormous tragedy. For years and decades, when Kashmiri pundits lived as refugees, you know, in Jammu and other places in India, no one cared in the Indian state mm. or the Indian establishment, no one across the political spectrum, whether from the right-wing Hindu nationalists who have taken power now or the Congress. No one cares. It's only now, in the last few years, when they have seized this opportunity to use Kashmiri pundits as a stick with which to beat Kashmiri Muslims and turn it into a communal Hindu versus Muslim thing, that they have suddenly remembered Kashmiri pundits. You know? And I feel, I, feel I, I have Kashmiri pundit friends. I went to a place called Gandhi Memorial College for my secondary school which was a pundit-run institution. You know. So my maternal home was next door to a Kashmiri pundit family you know, who disappeared overnight. You know. So I know what it means. I was there. It's not an academic exercise for me. You know. I had Kashmiri friends who I grew, grew up with. There are two boys called Sunil and Ashok you know, who I never seen. I mean, they left early you know, when I was a kid. But what I'm trying to say is when you suddenly remember, oh, we, we have to care about Kashmiri pundits, everyone knows that they do not have sympathy for the suffering Kashmiri pundits, you know. And it's especially damaging because you're using them. Yeah, they've been weaponized. Yeah. You know, when you're weaponizing the suffering of one community in order to demonize another, you know. And either way it's wrong. Or if you use the suffering of Kashmiri Muslims to demonize Kashmiri pundits, it's awful and horrible. And I'm never drawn into this. I'm never drawn into the hierarchies of victimhood either. You know? For me, as a Kashmiri writer who grew up there and saw it firsthand, the, there is a moment in Kashmir's history which is a moment of fracture. You know? And I like to think, as a storyteller, as a writer, as a journalist, that all these narratives belong to that single moment of fracture when the Kashmiri body politic explodes, and the result of which there is exodus happen. You know? mm. No one denies the suffering of Kashmiri pundits. But what cannot happen is that we keep saying that what about Kashmiri pundits, what about Kashmiri pundits, in order to diminish or minimize or erase the history of suppression of Kashmiris across the board from 1947 onwards. I'm so sorry, but we, we have run out of time. Um, uh, Wahid Thank will you all be for here. coming. And so please do, uh, and so will Victoria. If you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to go up to them and also to get your book. <laughs> Victoria Schofield, Mirza Wahid, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to make an announcement again. Um, 